Welcome back to Open Line. We have with us Tim Takis, elder law attorney. We're taking your questions, your calls about are you uh, how, how do you pay for caring for uh, an aging loved one? How do you plan for that? Uh, we have on the line here, we just had a call about a will, questions about wills. That's certainly a fascinating topic. Uh, let's go to Juanita now. Hello, Juanita. Are you there, Juanita? Yes. Hi, go right ahead. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, uh, isn't there an advocate for the elderly? There is the children. I'm in an assisted living facility, and uh, I'm having problems, and I've even been to be an administrator and can't seem to get anything done. And I have uh, asked it to forward, and they says that you have to go do uh, uh, to the court and this and that and the other. But isn't there some some uh, help uh, for the people that don't, and elderly people like me that don't have anyone. So Juanita, can you tell us a little bit about what problems that you're having where you're living? Well, uh, there is uh, a couple of gentlemen. One of them has uh, continuously gives me the bird with his finger, and that man has called me names and run and brought up employees and uh, names you wouldn't believe yeah on the other his buddy uh, that, that man is in a wheelchair mm. okay his buddy he's tried to knock me down and mm. didn't succeed mm. and then when that didn't he tried to pour hot coffee on me mm. oh my god I mean, and see i've been i went to everybody and uh Excuse me, I don't have any, you know, family to do anything for me. So isn't they, uh, I know they have advocates for children, and uh, yeah. I was wondering why can't they have advocates for the elderly? Well, they do, and it's called the Long-Term Care Ombudsman. Um, <clears throat> So she's in a situation, yeah. and she feels like she's being harassed she by is. other people yeah. in that facility. Right, and it sounds I, I, like I, I wish the facility would move her or listen to her, but it sounds like it sounds like she's not getting any response from the facility. They're saying is either it's not because one of the things that concerns me is, you know, is you know we we have to take her complaints seriously. Mm -hmm. um, we yeah, because clearly she's distressed. Right. You know, and what I'm thinking is, is that she's she's apparently she's gone to the administrator and has not gotten any any assistance. Her next step would be to talk to a, the long-term care ombudsman. I mean, I would suggest that if she would call, she could call our office because I don't know necessarily where she is and don't need to know where she is. Mm -hmm. But it may depend upon what facility that she's living in. You know, where we might might send her. Yeah, the long-term care ombudsman is a it's a it's a program that is operated by the state of Tennessee with uh, Older Americans Act funding, federal funding. Um, there is a state long-term care ombudsman. Um, you know, these are are people that they are advocates for older people. There is an uh, there is an ombudsman assigned to every assisted living and every nursing facility in the state of Tennessee. Really. You know they have uh, volunteers. There is a volunteers now. They, you know that that um, uh, that people, as I said, they can volunteer to be a, uh, like a volunteer ombudsman. Um, every there's, you know, it, there are nine districts, nine, nine uh, area agency and aging districts, and there is a <laughs> state long-term care ombudsman. You know, in each district. You know, is for, it hard to? get their attention? No, 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 it's not at all. Oh, good, okay. No. In so fact, um, she could probably, usually there is a, there's gonna be a sign like right in like, like right in the front door. And that's a requirement, right? Yes, that, that, yeah, that says, and that's posted right there that has, okay, this is, this is the person who is your ombudsman, this is the person if you have problems or complaints about what's going on in this facility, you know, it is a free call. Um, you know they you know the ombudsman take this stuff very seriously I happen to know something about it because and you know I've got I currently have a, a former district long-term care ombudsman as one of my elder care coordinators okay you know I've had other I've had another 
you know, one of my el another elder care coordinator I had was also a district long-term care ombudsman, you know, and they take the positions very seriously. Yeah, right. and they are advocates for older people in, in, you know, in nursing homes and assisted living. So for Juanita, we would say, look around um, the facility, the immediate area there. Like right there should, the, the number yeah. should be yeah. posted. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, call your office. Call Maybe you office. could help get her in the right get place. Get her in the right place. And we'll, you can say the number here. We'll put it up at the end of the show, but I guess if you don't yeah, mind saying yeah, it Yeah, sure. It's 615-824-2571. That's 615-824-2571. 2571 so you call our office and just call them our morning and say well you know because we do get calls and you know we welcome people that call you know that call we've had people that call in and say you know I'm that as you know from this says well I've you know my my parents who are in Iowa need somebody and I'll refer them to somebody in Iowa because I know lawyers I know elder law attorneys everywhere you know so if you have a question or a problem I want to hear from you and we'll, we'll try to get you into the right place uh, all right, well, thanks for the call, Anita. I hope that helps. And again, we'll put up the number at the end of the show once again. Let's go to Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Hi, what's on your mind? Uh, back in the uh, late 80s, uh, I, uh, my business and uh, personal life kind of went downhill, and I declared bankruptcy. And it was a complete bankruptcy. One, one of the loans uh, was a uh, insurance, paid up insurance, and uh, for about 25 years, uh, I thought it was pretty well dismissed. But uh, a larger insurance company bought out the smaller insurance company that I had the loan with, and uh, they started declaring a dividend. And uh, but their penalty is greater than their dividend, and uh, they basically have recreated the debt. And I, I called my attorney, and he said, "Well, you know, that's pretty close to thirty years ago. We don't have any records on it." Mm -hmm. And I, I called the uh, uh, bankruptcy court, and they said, "We well, don't have any records on it." And I don't have any records on it, so mm -hmm. I've kind of lost it. Your question is, what do you do about this? Yes. All right. Can you explain what's happening here? Like, I, I don't fully understand. Yeah, it sounds like, well, I, he owed money on a life insurance policy 30 years ago. I'm not really sure about how that happened, but maybe he barred against the policy or something. Right. And then you know could not pay it back and so then that got discharged I'm not sure how he would have a policy that would still be in force I mean I'm almost of the opinion and I and I'd certainly I'm preface, preface anything I say now is is that I don't do bankruptcy law and that's what we're talking about here yeah you're talking about bankruptcy law right you know debtor creditor law but it, it's almost one of those things where you almost want to say to him is is that well they know where the courthouse is you know in other words if they think that they they think that he owes money you know then you know they can file suit right you know and see you know and then he can explain you know the the situation to the judge yeah now i i'm reluctant you know i i don't necessarily agree that the bankruptcy court does not have those records because they're not you know they're going to be on microfilm they're going to if they're in middle tennessee then they're you know they don't just like throw that stuff away right now they may they may microfilm it they may do something like that you know they just don't want to go look for it right you know but he may have to you know it may, it may come down to that you know if they do file suit against him interesting yeah but i you know i'm that's that's getting into a different area. It really is getting into a different area. Because I start thinking about bankruptcy. Is it a consumer protection problem? You know, are they trying to sue him for something or get him, you know, that he doesn't owe? I mean, it's kind of clear to me. It's like, how did this happen? Yeah, and 30 how do you years, go back? Yeah, how do you go back, yeah. you know, on this policy that suddenly it's like somebody, like it came back from the dead and now they're saying, is you owe this money? It's like, what, what do you mean? Nightmare. Yeah. Let's go before we go to break. Let's go to Jennifer. Yeah. Is that right, Jennifer? Yes, that's right. Go right ahead, Jennifer. 
Okay, um, my question is this. My husband and I had wills drawn up in another state that were executed by an attorney, and we are curious as to whether or not our will is valid in the state of Tennessee. It's drawn up in another state. Is it valid here? The answer is, if it was valid in the state where they executed it, it's valid here. That's what I thought, mm -hmm. but I wanted to turn to you. Yes. Matt. So if, yeah, of course it is. It is valid here. But that's actually it's it's you know we that that, com that question comes up maybe more than you think. People move to Tennessee or whatever it is, and they think, well, you know, they must have. Do we have Sharia law, or they have some <laughs> kind of weird thing here that goes on, you know, where okay, you know, I did this in New Jersey, and they come, you know, when because the South is different. And, and then, then maybe but you some put a people think about on there. That. You put a caveat if it was valid in that state. Yes. Um, and how do you know it was valid in that well, state? Well, because what she's saying is, is that, you know, presumably she went to a, you know, an attorney. The attorney drafted it. The attorney helped them execute it and everything else. And presumably, if it was valid there, it's going to be valid in Tennessee. Now, should they change it? Well, a lot of it depends upon, um, you know, has something changed? you know, about their estate plan or that would affect their estate plan other than that just they moved. Right. You know, maybe the beneficiaries, that, you know, maybe there's, um, maybe the personal representative or the executor lives in that other state. You know, maybe children have gotten older, other sorts of reasons why they need to change it. How often do you think people update wills? I mean, you, you hear about it, you write it, and then you forget about it. Can you, can you really do that? You write it and just put it away and just never really... Well, I guess people do that. They do yeah, that, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do that a lot. Yeah. And, that, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but the executor, that kind of thing, could... could yeah, and then you, you know, and that's the real problem is, is like, we always tell people, we say, yeah, it's still good, but just, you know, as they're, you know, look it over, you know, every year or so, you know, People get married, people get divorced, people go bankrupt, people become disabled or incapacitated, people have creditor problems, people get addictions, you know, all sorts of things that may happen, you know, that may affect, uh, you know, how you do your estate plan. Maybe you have a parent, you know, I've had family members, you know, walk I've had people walk into my office, you know, 60, 70 year old people that they've got a spouse, she's got a spouse in the nursing home. Well, she, meaning the wife, she's got a 90-some-year-old mother, you know, who's got several hundred thousand dollars. And it's like, well, if you die, if mom dies and leaves you money, you know, then that's going to affect your husband's eligibility for benefits. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so sometimes, you know, you, if people, if they inherit money from, like, from their parents, you know, it affects what happens. You know, there's a lot of 60-some-year-olds out there who are in worse shape physically and, and mentally than 90-year-olds. <laughs> yeah. You know, and those 90-year-olds die, and if they leave assets to those 60-year-olds, that's not, they, they may not be a good idea. Very. All right, we're going to take a break. Yeah. Uh, if you want to call in, there's the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. Already a couple questions about wills. Those are always interesting. But anything else? Uh, planning for uh, financially for caring for an aging loved one. We'll take a break. Be back right after this. Staying healthy.